I don't say it lightly when I say I'm truly excited about the release of this camera right here. This is the DJI Osmo Pocket 3, and this camera has some big leaps over the DJI Osmo Pocket 2. In fact, the features on this camera make it a leap over a lot of other cameras that are competing in the vlogging camera sector. Inside the box, we've got the camera gimbal unit right here, the Pocket 3, and we've got some paperwork down in here as well. The DJI Quick Start Guide. This is gonna just give you the steps of how to pair it with the app. There's gonna be that requirement to pair it with the app to activate it the first time. That is important to note. And inside here, we have a few additional accessories. Basically, you can plug this into the bottom of the Pocket 3. And this is gonna give you the ability to mount this on a tripod mounting plate if you would like to. And of course, you have a USB-C to USB-C cable in here. And there's also a wrist strap if you'd like to use that to hang on to the camera. All right, so let's get the Pocket 3 opened up here. And I will say right away, this feels solid in the hands. I like how it feels. It's actually quite a bit heavier than I would have expected. And there is this nice holding case here, which is good because you have to remember this is a gimbal here and you don't want this to get hit or bumped while it's in your pocket because this could get twisted and broken eventually. So it's a good idea to keep it in this when it is in your pocket or when you're transporting it. And of course, you'll notice inside the case, there is a spot to put the black pro mist filter as well as the wide angle lens. And these are both optional accessories from DJI. The wide angle lens allows you to go a little bit wider because the default width on here is 20 millimeters. And the wide angle lens is 15 millimeters. And then the black pro mist filter is an optional filter that DJI sells, but some other companies have similar filters. I like the Freewell filter set for this because you get a lot with that. I'm going to have a separate video on those Freewell filters, but those are really nice for this camera. And we're going to take this off. This is the screen protector here. And looking at the camera, there's really not a lot to note on the outside. This is your micro SD card slot, which I'm going to put a micro SD card in right now. The card that I recommend is this one from SanDisk right here. It's the SanDisk Extreme Pro. And this one happens to be 256 gigabyte. If you're going to be doing a lot of vlogging on this, that's probably going to be OK as long as you copy your files off after each adventure. But if not, you may want to get the 512 version of this just so you always have plenty of space. And the way you're going to insert that is you're going to put it so the text is facing toward this textured side where it says DJI. And you do have to press in pretty hard to get it to clip into place. But you'll hear that click and you just want to make sure the card is all the way in. If the card's not in, the camera will yell at you telling you it doesn't have a micro SD card because there is no internal storage in here. Looking at the back, you've got this nice textured grip here. And on the bottom, this is the USB-C port. So if you decide to use this optional piece here, that gives the tripod mount and some additional handle to hold on to. So I recommend using this. But if you don't use this, you can connect the USB-C cable direct to this when you're hooking it up to your computer or to charge it later on. But I'm going to click this into place right now. Pops nicely into place. And you just want to make sure both of these latches here are down securely. And I like that. That gives a little bit extra handle to work with. And then coming around to the part of the screen that you're probably going to have facing you most of the time. This is a little joystick here, and you can use this to maneuver the gimbal around if you want to point it up more, down more, left or right. This is going to be how you do that. And then this is going to be the power button here or the record button. Now for powering this on, you don't have to use this. You also can rotate the screen. When you do that, it's going to power on automatically. And then when you rotate it back vertically, it's going to power off in about two seconds if you don't interact with the screen to stop it. Just like that right there. But this is also how you can do portrait mode on this device too, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But let's get through the initial setup here so we can get to the fun stuff. So I'm going to click English there. You can skip the activation five times if you want to. I don't recommend doing that. I recommend just activating it and getting it done with. So I'm going to do the activation process right now. And in order to do the activation process, you do need to make sure you have the DJI Mimo app on your phone. And you also can use a device like an iPad. I'm actually going to use my iPad for the Mimo app. So I'm going to open the DJI Mimo app. It's going to tell me Osmo device found. I'm going to click connect. It's going to do searching. It's going to ask for the verification code, which is going to show up right here on the Osmo Action 3. I'm going to click accept and it's going to finish pairing on here. Terms of use, I'm going to click agree to that. And in order to activate it, you have to select allow access for DJI to access the device. I'm going to click there, click next. It's going to prompt you to log in here. So if you don't have a DJI account, you will have to create one going to enter in that info and then we're going to proceed. And then once it's logged in, you're going to click activate and it's going to offer you a warranty. I'm going to skip that. Let's click get started. 
It's going to talk about a few different features of the app. If you're interested in those, I'm going to toggle through those. It's going to tell you to update the firmware regularly, which is important for the features and any bug fixes. I click next. It's going to connect to the pocket three wirelessly. And then it should prompt us for a firmware update, which we're going to install when it does. And there's the firmware update. So that's going to install and it talks about what's there. So it added image adjustment, sharpness and noise reduction. If you've seen the DJI Osmo Action 4, a lot of those settings in the menus on there are going to be similar on here. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Hyperlapse modes. It also added screen rotate and capture, low light shooting mode, image quality, enhanced color performance, and optimized skin tone performance in multiple scenes. So what you're going to see on here is you're going to see update in progress, wait two minutes. So I'm going to let this finish here and then we'll get into the menus and the best settings. All right. The app says we're done, then the camera is about to catch up. Now it's time to take a look at the menu on here. So initially it's going to show you some of those key features on the display here, like swipe from left to enter playback. Of course, there's not going to be any files on there right now. Swipe from right to change image and audio parameters. We'll look at those in a moment. Tap to switch between shooting modes down here at the bottom. And again, this menu, if you own any other DJI products, this is going to look really similar to a lot of those, which is nice. I like it when Companies keep their menus relatively similar across products. It makes it much easier to utilize their products. And here's where you tap to select smart gimbal modes. We'll get into that as well. And down here is where you tap to rotate gimbal. And here's where you can zoom. And here's where you can check the battery level, which by the way, DJI says you should be able to get approximately 166 minutes of battery life if you're doing 1080p, but in 4K 60, DJI does say you're supposed to be able to get about two hours, so about 120 minutes with the battery in here, which is really good considering the size of this and the fact that it does fit in your pocket. That's very impressive. All right, so we're gonna swipe down this main menu and let's take a look at a couple of these settings. So this is where you can create and manage custom modes. And right now we don't have any modes to save, but when we do, we're gonna utilize this to do that. So these are your options for screen rotate and capture. And then when you turn on the camera, this is basically asking, what do you want it to default to? Do you want it to be the last setting? Do you want it to be video mode? Do you want it to be low light or hyperlapse? I usually just stick with last setting because generally if I power this off and then power it on again, by default, I'm most often going to be using that last setting. For the brightness, you can adjust this. If you put it a little bit dimmer, it will help a little bit with the battery life in here because this display is going to be one of the primary users of battery other than recording and writing to the micro SD card. This right here is where you can enable or disable the face tracking and selfie mode. I recommend having it enabled because when you have it enabled and you have the gimbal facing toward you, this is going to find your face and lock onto it. So that way, if you're moving like this or this and you're talking to the camera, the camera is going to follow you on the gimbal. So you don't have to worry about getting your head cut off in a scene or something like that. Unless of course you bring it really close, which the minimum focal distance on here is about eight inches, a little bit less than eight inches. But in general, if you're vlogging with this, you're probably going to have it way further back than eight inches anyway. But that is important to note to make sure you follow that. Otherwise your subject, whether it be your face, someone else, anything, if you're closer than eight inches to it, it won't be in focus. So I'm going to enable that there. Let's go to the settings menu here. In this mode, wireless mic, if you have the DJI wireless mic, you can pair them to this and you can pair up to two of them. DJI does sell a pair of them. So you could be talking and someone else could be talking. It could be feeding the audio to this video feed and you can set a default gimbal startup direction so you can have forwards, backwards or last setting. In this case, I'm going to choose last setting because I feel like that's going to be most applicable and the rotate screen to power off. I recommend keeping that set to two seconds. And then when you rotate the screen, like I showed you before, it'll power off automatically if you don't interact with the screen for two seconds. If you do anything on the screen, like tap it, it'll stop the power off sequence. And that's when you can have it vertically in that portrait mode for filming anytime you want to in that mode. So if you enable selfie flip, this mirrors the image automatically. It basically gives you a better selfie effect. For the OTG connection, this is going to apply to Android devices only. For the wireless connection, in most cases, you shouldn't have to mess with those settings. So if you enable wearable mode, basically this adjusts some settings on the camera. And one of those settings is a gimbal mode will be changed to tilt locked. This is to enable that POV type of footage. But if you do enable this at any point, if you want to disable it, just swipe up and it's going to disable it. 
So I do recommend doing the gimbal calibration here the first time. And what you want to do when you do that is before you hit confirm, you want to stand it up something like this. You don't want to be hanging on to it because it needs to be on a relatively flat surface. So I'm going to click confirm. It does give you a three second countdown to put it on a flat surface. You're going to see the gimbal moving around while it calibrates. And then when it's done, it's going to say calibration successful. And then you can hit confirm for the joystick speed for the zoom. I recommend just keeping it at four. I typically don't recommend zooming with this camera. You can a little bit though, but if you want to zoom, I recommend doing it later on because the zoom on here is digital. So if you want to, you can crop it later on when you're editing and it's going to give you better results. And gimbal is the same thing. You have a range of one to seven. I like the gimbal to be at four right there in the middle. And this is going to relate to the sensitivity. So if you're rotating it around, it's going to control how quick or how sensitive it is. So if you have it up at seven, it's going to be really hypersensitive to any adjustments you make. But if you have it at one, it's going to be very, very slow and not very sensitive. For the video compression, I do recommend keeping that set to HEVC. It's going to give you the highest quality video while also giving you a more efficient file size. So your file size will be a little bit smaller proportionate to the quality of video you get. For the sounds, I typically just keep those at medium on here. Medium is a good option. Not too loud, not too quiet. For the grid, I like to turn that on. I like having the thirds on my screen. That makes it really good for framing shots exactly as I want them to be. For the anti-flicker, I'm going to set this to 60 hertz because I'm in the United States. Depending on what country you live in, you may want to set it to 50 or you may want to set it to 60. This can help with flicker in certain scenes, but it's not always guaranteed to get rid of all flicker from artificial lighting. Time code, of course, is if you want to have time codes to sync. That doesn't really apply for most people, but if you have several of these and you want to sync them by time code, that's a great option. Naming management, you can delve into this if you want to change how this camera names the files and the folders on your micro SD card. I usually just leave it at the defaults because I like the defaults that DJI has chosen. Screen off room recording, I recommend keeping this at the default of never. I like to always see what's on my screen when I'm recording. For the auto power off, I like to keep this at two minutes. And this is going to be if I'm not recording, not doing anything with this, not interacting with it, it'll power off after two minutes. This can be great in case I accidentally powered it on. Say if I didn't have it in this case, this case should prevent it from being powered on. But just in case, I like doing the two minutes there. The LED is the status light in this camera. I like to have the LED on. I like to know if it's recording or not recording. And you can live stream with this camera. You can use it as a webcam, which is a great feature. But of course, you do have to live stream through the DJI MIMO app. And this is going to be if you're picking up from a prior live stream and you want to continue with that. Down here is where you would format your micro SD card. I do recommend doing this the first time around, but do make sure you don't have any data on your micro SD card first, because if you do, dragging this to format will wipe out all that data. And in general, what I do is I like to format it about once a month or so after copying off any files, if I still have any on there that I haven't copied yet. I find that keeps things working best and I find that helps prevent corruption. Then if you ever have a need to factory reset your device, you can select this right here and that's going to do a factory reset. Then device info like the name of it, the serial number and the firmware version will all be down here. All right, let's check out this next button right here. This is for changing the shooting orientation. So if you select that and you go here, it's going to keep it vertical and I didn't tap it in time, so it powered off on me. I'm going to go back horizontal to turn it back on. I like to keep this on the default of auto rotation. I think that's the best way to use this camera. For the rotational speed, you can choose slow, default, or fast. Personally, I like slow. That's going to help slow this down when it rotates. And I feel like that makes really smooth, good looking videos. Too fast can be kind of jarring, but what type of video you're making, it might be appropriate to have it move fast but I'm going to keep slow here and then final button here. So these are the different gimbal modes and it kind of explains what each one is there. Follow mode is suitable for most scenarios, including vlogs or selfies. Tilt locked is the horizon line is kept level. And I personally, I like tilt locked. I like to keep the horizon level. There are situations where I don't want it level if I'm getting really creative or showing like a dramatic scene. And if you want to do that, I would do FPV. And that's where the camera is going to rotate freely. It's going to follow device movement. But I personally like to set this to tilt locked. But again, you choose what works best for you. All right, so that is our main general menu up here. 
Next thing I want to do is I want to show you how to set your resolution and frame rate. And we're going to do that down here at the bottom. I'm just going to swipe up. And if you've owned the DJI Osmo Action 3 or Osmo Action 4, this menu is going to feel and look almost identical, which is, again, really great. I like it that DJI does that. Now, for the best settings video mode here, I recommend always shooting in 4K. 4K is going to give you the real highest quality out of this. And especially now that we're working with a whopping one inch sensor in this tiny little camera, definitely recommend that 4K. Now for resolution up here, you do have a couple options. You can do 16 by nine or one to one, but I recommend keeping it at 16 by nine. And as far as the frame rate, if you want to slow down some of that footage later on, I recommend doing 4K 60, because then if you put it on a 30 frames per second timeline, you can go at half speed. And if you put it on a 24 frames per second timeline, you can go 40% of the original speed. But if you're just talking to the camera and you don't want to slow down anything in your scene, then I recommend doing 4K 24 or 4K 30. But of course, we also can save custom modes. So what I recommend doing after I have this all set up, I'm going to save a 4K 60 mode, and then I'm going to save a 4K 24 mode. So that I'm going to have those modes that I can quickly toggle between to select what I want, depending on what I'm filming. So after we've set that, we swipe back down and then we swipe over to set our other parameters. And you want to make sure to select Pro here. So some of these settings are going to be a little bit different than I would normally set on a lot of cameras. And part of the reason is because this is a gimbal. This camera is built onto a gimbal and this is being physically stabilized and we don't have electronic image stabilization to worry about here. EIS is what gives a lot of that ghosting jittery footage that you can see with cameras like the Osmo Action 3 and 4. Pretty much any action camera that depends on EIS. When you have too slow of a shutter speed, that's what gives you your jitter and ghosting. But you don't actually have to worry about that on here, which is a very nice feature. But for the ISO range, the nice thing is the ISO goes all the way down to 50 for the lowest, which is really good ISO. I like to just keep it set to the default range here, 50 to 6400. Because this camera does have a low light mode that does a really good job with noise reduction, which we'll get to in a moment. For the EV comp, I like to have stuff slightly underexposed. That way, some of those details in clouds and other things are not blown out. So I like to do negative 0.3 just to have that slight underexposure. I feel like that footage ends up looking best later on. And you can always add a little bit of exposure back there to help balance it out when editing. So I'm going to click confirm there. And then for white balance, I like to set this to a static value. So I'm going to click the M and then I'm going to drag this up to 5000 K. So if I am just vlogging during the middle of the day on a normal day, I'm going to do 5000 K. If I'm doing something like a time lapse or vlogging at sunrise or sunset, I'm going to set this higher to about 6500 K. It's going to really help highlight those really cool colors during that time of day. But if it's normal daytime, I like 5000 K. That helps keep the footage from getting too warm looking. It keeps it a nice balance there. And when you have a consistent white balance later on to edit everything against, it's also very helpful. Now the glamour effect here, you can toggle that on or off. I usually keep it off, but if you want to use it, it can help smooth out skin, like if you're doing a selfie mode, so, or if you're filming somebody. So if you want to use that, that's where you would change that. For color, I recommend doing D log M. If you want to grade that footage later on, this is going to be how you get the very best footage out of this camera. But if you don't want to color grade later on, then I recommend doing the HLG mode right here. That's basically a high dynamic range mode, but it is also in 10 bit. I don't really recommend selecting normal on here. Normal is 8 bit and there's no reason to do 8 bit. 8 bit is about 16 million possible color shades, but 10 bit is about 1 billion color shades. So I recommend choosing one of the 10 bit modes, depending on what you want to do with the footage in post production. So I'm going to set it to D log M. Now you also can set the focus mode here. And the nice thing about the DJI Osmo Pocket 3 is this does have autofocus. So you can get that nice autofocus on a subject or a person. And you can have some of that bokeh in the background with the background blurred. So whatever you're filming can really stand out. And that makes this a lot nicer than something like an action camera because with action cameras, they don't have the autofocusing feature. So continuous, it'll tell you what each mode does over here. This is really gonna depend on what you're filming at the time and what you're looking for. Single is good if you have like a motionless subject, but if you have subjects that are moving, I recommend continuous. 
that's going to help keep the autofocus going where it needs to. And the autofocus, it's dual pixel in this camera. And there is also showcase mode. So when you use showcase mode, if you hold up something in front of the camera, the camera is going to focus on that object and it's not going to be looking for faces or eyes. And it's pretty responsive on that. I really like how that worked. But I recommend in most cases keeping it in the continuous mode. For the image adjustment, I like to do a couple adjustments here. I like to bump down the sharpness to negative two. I don't want my footage over sharp. Really over sharp footage does not look great. So I recommend keeping it at negative two. For the noise reduction, if you are shooting in D-Log M, generally you're gonna wanna put that all the way down as low as it will go. But if you are using HLG, I recommend just keeping it here in the middle and it's gonna let the camera do some noise reduction, but not entirely. And then over here is your audio settings and I recommend keeping the set to stereo. For the noise reduction, it's gonna really depend on where you're filming. If you're in a noisy environment, it's really windy or a construction site, I recommend keeping this on. But if you're not, you may wanna just keep that off because it's gonna give you the best audio. Sometimes the noise reduction can amplify and then suddenly make stuff really quiet and it can be distracting and not sound great. So if you are gonna use the audio from this, I generally recommend keeping it off. I usually just keep directional audio at all, but you can adjust it so it's only the front if you want, or just the front and back, but I usually just keep it set to all. Once you've keyed in all those settings, you can swipe down and select this, and I'm gonna save this to my C1 mode. And this is gonna be the mode I use most of the time for most of my filming because I like to have that flexibility later on to slow down the footage if I want to. So I'm gonna click confirm here. Then what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna just go down here, I'm gonna swipe up from the bottom and I'm gonna tweak this to a 4K 24 mode. And I'm gonna save another preset of that mode. And that's gonna be when I don't want to slow down the footage at all. I'm gonna click confirm. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna click on this mode down here and I wanna customize the low light video mode next. You can only use this in 4K24 to 4K30, but I like to set it to 4K24 because that's what I'm going to do for my finished production. And that's about it. There's not really a need to customize anything else further for that low light mode. It does a lot of really good noise reduction in here. So there is also a slow motion mode on this camera and you can do up to 4K20 in that. But a couple important things to note. Let's first set it to 4K120. And 4K120 on here, at least until there's another firmware update, that could change this, but until then, 4K 120 is only an 8-bit on here. So that's kind of a, a bummer because you can do 4K 120 in 10-bit on like the Osmo Action 4, but hopefully DJI will enable the ability to do 4K 120 with at least the 10-bit HLG and maybe the D-Log. So if I want slow motion for now, I'm going to probably just use the 4K 60, but if you want that extreme slow motion, I recommend 4K 120. And it still looks good, but it's just not 10 bit. So something to be aware of. And you can also do time lapses on here. So for time lapse, I recommend going to custom here. And then up here, I recommend changing it to 4K 30. And then when we swipe up again, they've got a couple presets here. Like you can do hyperlapse, time lapse, or motion lapse, which is cool. And I recommend just changing all of these to 4K 30. I'm going to do the same thing for the hyperlapse. That way, when I quickly select these when I'm out vlogging, they're all set up and ready to go. And let's just start with the hyperlapse mode since it's the first one selected there. I usually just keep this at auto. I feel like auto gives the best results. This camera is pretty smart at detecting what's best with that. So I keep that set to auto. Now for time lapses, I like to customize a little bit. I like to first of all do custom. And then for the individual parameters, I like to put the duration to infinity. I don't want it to randomly end on me. That could happen like in the middle of a sunset at the best part. So I don't want to be committed to a certain setting, but I do like to keep the interval generally between two seconds and five seconds for a daytime or sunset time lapse. I'm going to keep it at two seconds right here. And for the motion lapse, this of course is going to have your camera. It's going to pan. And what it's going to do is it's going to give you the option of left to right or right to left or custom motion where you can actually set up waypoints. So that's pretty cool. I generally just recommend selecting left to right or right to left, but if you really want to customize it, you can set the number of waypoints and you can really fine tune that. But I'm going to keep left to right here and you can also set the duration for that. So depending on how long you want it to film it, I do think that the 10 minute duration is great. It's gonna give you an eventual 10 second motion lapse if you use the two second interval here. 
which I do recommend using the two second or the one second interval for that. That's going to give you the, the best content to work with. I'm going to keep two seconds. And the important thing to note with the time lapse, motion lapse and hyperlapse modes is you can customize the format. So for those, I do recommend doing video in raw as long as you have the space on your micro SD card, because that does give you flexibility later on when editing. So you're not just stuck with the video. You can use the raw to really bring out those details and custom grade. So I recommend doing that. And then for the exposure settings, I recommend doing the negative 0.3 EV, but the white balance, I do like to set that to the static value of 5,000 K. And once you set that, if you go like to time-lapse mode here and then swipe over, you have to do it again in that mode as well. You have to do it for each of the modes essentially. So I'm going to put in all those settings here for the format video plus raw. I like to have that here too, for that maximum flexibility. And then I'm going to do the same thing under hyperlapse. Toggle that over, do our negative 0.3, weight balance of 5,000 K and focus mode continuous. And for the sharpness, I'm going to put that to negative two and noise reduction. I'm going to do negative two as well. And there are also photo and panorama modes on here, but you're pretty limited to what you can adjust in these modes. But if you're going to use these, I recommend using raw for the photo because that's going to give you the highest results. And then for exposure, I recommend the negative 0.3. White balance, I recommend static of 5,000K. Format raw and photo mode continuous. And you can swipe up here and it's going to give you a couple different options. You can do the 180 degree mode or the 3x3. I like to do the 3x3 mode, which is going to basically give you nine different photos. And then photo mode, if you want to take a photo on here, I recommend doing the one by one because that's going to give you the square. And it's going to maximize the resolution on this camera. It's going to use the entire sensor, so I recommend that. Then I recommend the same exposure settings here as well. And for the white balance, I recommend 5000K format. I recommend JPEG plus raw because then you have that raw later on that you can edit with. In focus mode continuous, I recommend. All right, so those are all of the best settings on there. And there is one other thing I want to show you on the main screen here that's important to note. So if you click over here on the left, this relates to how you frame your subject. So the default mode here, face auto detect. When enabled, the camera will automatically follow the face closest to the center of the camera's view. Depending on where you are, that could be good or that might not be good. And it also depends on what you're filming. So keep that in mind. The next option down here is dynamic framing. And this lets you push the joystick to switch the focus on the frame. And then you can press the button to start or stop following a subject. The last mode down here is spin shot. And this enables you to rotate the camera 90 degrees or 180 degrees to have unique camera movements. If you click start, that's going to enable that mode. But then when you want to leave that mode, just click here and click exit. Then it's going to go back to the normal default filming. And a couple other things to note about the joystick. If you ever want to reset it, if your gimbal is looking in a certain direction, if you've played with it and let's say you have it pointing down like this and you want to reset it, just tap twice and it's going to recenter it. And then if you want to have it face toward you, tap three times and the gimbal's going to rotate and it's going to look toward you. And there's the automatic face tracking right there. And then tap two times to recenter it when it's facing toward you and tap three times and it's going to rotate back again, looking away from you. And a couple other things I want to mention about this camera is the battery in here does have fast charging capabilities, which is phenomenal. I love it because it's not a removable battery. So the battery that you have in here is what you have for your adventure. So if you plug this in with a 65 watt or higher charger, the battery will charge from zero to 80% in 16 minutes. And then if you wanna do zero to 100%, I believe it takes about 36 minutes or so. And what I recommend is I recommend having an external power bank with you. I love this one from Anchor right here. This holds 20,000 milliamp hours. And all you have to do is plug it in and it's going to charge your battery in here while you're taking a break. So if you took a 16 minute break from recording and you were getting close to zero, this would take you all the way back up to 80% in 16 minutes. And this does have the ability to fast charge it. And I think it's worth mentioning here too, this camera is not waterproof, so you can't go underwater with this like you can with an action camera. Do remember this is a vlogging camera, but it's not meant for intense action. so. If you were to drop this or smash it into something, the weakest part on this is gonna be the gimbal right here. The gimbal would be relatively easy to break, so keep that in mind. But I will say the gimbal is very strong 
and the motors are very good. So if you're running with this camera, it does a surprisingly good job of stabilizing the footage while you're running. So I hope you have a great time with your DJI Osmo Pocket 3 and stay tuned for more videos with this incredible new camera.